Today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Hobie Wedler. I'm Nana Hinesley from Launch Strategically. I'm a career coach that believes that if I can expose you to incredible people that are doing incredible things, it'll give you a vision for your future of what's possible for you. Hobie has done so many things that I don't have all day to tell you all of them, but he has founded a nonprofit organization. He has a PhD in organic chemistry. Oh my gosh. I mean, seriously, I, I can't even imagine having a PhD in organic chemistry. So that's huge in itself. He owns his own company. He was recognized by President Obama for his accomplishments in his life, but I'm not going to ruin the surprise. I'm going to let Hobie tell you all about who he is and what he's doing these days. Hey, Hobie. Nana, wow, that was a, that was a glowing introduction. Thank you for that, and uh, hope I can live up to it. It's an honor to meet, it's an honor to know you, and it's an honor to uh, to meet everyone that, that follows you. Um, I think what you're doing is incredibly powerful, and I'm just excited to be able to chat with you today. Oh, gosh, it's my pleasure, Hobie, no doubt about it. Where would you like to begin? Why did you start studying uh, organic chemistry? Let me take you back to my very early childhood. Is that okay? Oh, please. So I was born totally blind to a couple of sighted parents. Now, my parents are very much go-getters and always have been. Um, they just believe in, you know, whatever whatever you want is possible, Um and they've had their, you know, their struggles and their triumphs, just like all of us. And and they just have a have a view of life and of what their what their kids could do that uh, you know that was just so so refreshing and uh, and comforting, if you will. Um, so if you if you can imagine being a sighted parent and not having any idea that this person that you are uh, uh, producing. Uh, might be totally blind. And then this person, me, is born and you realize, okay, there are big eye issues and he may never be able to see. Uh, boy, I, I, I understand now um, and, and know a lot of blind people myself, but if I was in their situation, really not knowing very many blind people and not having necessarily a, a huge need to know a lot of blind people, uh, I can imagine the the worry and the fear and the the what they went through. They went through that for about, I don't know, 12, 14 hours, something like that, until uh, my mom decided to pick up the phone and call her best friend from college, Barb. She called Barb, and Barb's husband, Steve, answered. And Barb could hear Steve in the background saying, oh, no. Oh, my God, what are we going to do? Oh, this is just a tragedy. And Barb, being the, the person that she is, grabbed the phone right away and said, what's going on? What, what's happening? Tell me. And Terry relayed the message that, well, Hobie was born, but he's blind. And Barb said, oh, thank God, blind is all. And you know, the way Steve was talking, I thought he was dead. <laughs> you know, blind we can deal with. And, and Barb then went on to tell my mom why she had that attitude, which is because her father's best friend was totally blind. And her father was a psychology professor at, at a, a very well-respected university and didn't necessarily do a lot around the, around the house, wasn't all that handy. But his friend, John, the blind man, was also a professor, but did everything with his hands. And you know, if the dishwasher was broken, he would fix it. If the washing machine had issues, he would fix it. They'd always call John and go pick him up at his house and bring him over and, and have him help them with uh, with mechanical problems and whatnot, uh, which I think is, is just great. And, um, you know, really explains well, um, you know, that, that blind people can do whatever the heck they want. And Barb, as a young girl, grew up around this and knew that anything was possible. Didn't have to be told, right? She just saw it happen. She saw it come together. And, um, had no issue with, with someone who's blind and basically said, blind people can do whatever they want. And that led my parents to have extraordinarily high expectations of, of what I could do. And my parents for my brother and me did, did two, and my brother cited by the way, he's two years older, did two big things. Number one, they had extremely high expectations of us and expect us to have the same very high expectations of them in return, mm -hmm. which was great. And number two, and, and we did, and we still all have very high expectations of each other. And the second thing they did is they told us time and time again that this is this life that we live is our life, 
And it's our responsibility to, to do what we will with it, whether we, you know, however we treat it, however we take it, it's, it's our life. And we're responsible for taking blame when blame is, is necessary and taking credit when credit is due. And boy, that led both of us to just be really strong thinkers. And, um, you know, it was our life. I couldn't blame an assistant if something didn't go right for me. You know, it wasn't, I wasn't able to, to basically put the blame and problem of what can we do um, on anybody but myself. And when you're, you know, I, I know a lot of other, happen to know a lot of other blind folks who, you know, are, are great people. And, and as they're, as they're learning, they get a lot, you know, as they're, as they're you know, going through school, for instance, they get a lot of assistance and maybe when something doesn't go right, they can blame their assistance that they've, that they've had. Um, and my parents were all about me getting assistance and feeling fine about asking for help, but I owned those relationships. And if anything went wrong, it was, it was my bad. And, and if anything was great, it was mine to celebrate. So that just was incredible for both me and my brother. Um, I loved taking things apart. I've had a hyper interest, an interest in sort of hyper locality, things happening right around me. So how the water system works. I remember standing at the, at the kitchen tap at three years old, turning on the water to fill a glass of water. And I'd done this a hundred times before, but I, I, at that moment, I had this sort of um, thought carry over me of how does this work? When I turn on this faucet and water comes out, where, where's this water coming from? So that led to a whole understanding and discovery of, you know, basically plumbing and this revelation that water was being pressurized all over the town that I lived in and, and carried to houses and commercial buildings and everywhere. And ultimately, uh, you know, led to a, a field trip that I took with my parents down to the water treatment department and, and all sorts of things. But that started my, my love for science. My mom was actually a teacher of the visually impaired. She adopted that career uh, after being an educator long before I was born, but then uh, thinking even before I was born about getting into special education and really acting on that desire uh, once I was born and getting into a career in, in special ed, but in particular training people who are blind um, in, in the kindergarten through 12th grade sort of age range. And it was just incredible uh, to, to have that. But my dad did uh, everything that we worked on at the house, everything that was done at the house was done by us, my, my family, I mean. So we didn't hire, hire things out at all, which allowed my brother and me to really learn how work is done, how things are, 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 are done around a house. And that, you know, that drove my passion for full, further understanding plumbing and electricity and, and, and really digging into to science, taking things apart and putting them back together. Chemistry was something that I fell in love with um, in, in high school, I think largely due to a, a really inspiring chemistry instructor. And, uh, you know, I, I was just good at it. It just made sense to me. One thing led to another and I ended up, uh, up you know, going to UC, my chemistry teacher in high school, by the way, was really interesting because at the beginning of our, our time together when I was in her honors chemistry class, she would say to the whole class, now you guys can do whatever it is you want to do. Don't be afraid to get out there and just just do what it is that you that you wish to do and and do it well and and, and this that and the other and then I would go talk to her and she'd say yeah Hobie you know I don't know if chemistry makes sense for you as a blind person we really should think about this and on well, you know okay that's that's interesting there's a lot to take in here um, but I went to her and I said you know nobody can see atoms and from that point on she said you're right chemistry is <laughs> not a visual science and became my true ally and a mentor for me. And, and as I, as we said in our conversation, I think before you hit record, you know, mentors are people who see a future in us before we necessarily see it for ourselves. She saw that in me and, and encouraged me to go to UC Davis, University of California, Davis, that is, and study chemistry um, in my own, in, 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 and do what was right for me. So I did that and, and just loved it and, and thrived in that, in that environment. And, uh, you know, really didn't want to do, be a chemistry researcher for my entire career. I just wanted to teach. And I've always had the heart of a teacher. My passion was really to get into anything where I could, you know, and chemistry was the, was the lens at that time. I wanted to walk into a full lecture hall of freshman chemistry students at 8 a.m. on a Monday morning after a weekend of parties and, 
and in spite and basically you know not I, i'd be dreaming if i thought i could change all their minds but get a couple of them at least to say wow chemistry is interesting and i i never knew what i was missing uh without you know thinking of what only thinking about chemistry is a prerequisite maybe get them excited to to study chemistry further um but i had, had the honor of teaching a couple and one thing led to another and i ended up applying to graduate school and getting in also at university of california davis into a computational chemistry lab and uh i had the the honor of, of teaching a few freshman chemistry classes while in grad school what i realized is that students don't really speak chemistry anymore they like to and they don't read the textbook ahead of time. They like to see pictures of what's happening, little animations, what have you. And it just it never, never felt quite, um, quite right to me. So it was, uh, you know, just students, like I say, didn't didn't necessarily speak science. Um, so and, when you say, um, I know you prior to us getting on, you were saying that you created images for them to see. But I guess you had to rely on your assistant for those images? Largely, yeah, I would explain exactly what I'd want to show them and then they'd, they'd put them together. But really, truthfully, it's all about it's all about just collaborating and coming together and figuring out the right ways to do things. And I decided that maybe teaching chemistry wasn't for me, but I was so deep into the path of attaining my PhD that I ended up earning it. And I'm very happy that I did. And I, I'm always, I'd say once a chemist, always a chemist. So I really am... And still a chemist in everything that I do, and uh, and love that work. Really love that work uh, Can we immensely. See your um, your winery thing, because I just think that is so cool. Oh man, yeah. So so I'm in addition to being a chemist, I'm an entrepreneur as well. And uh, while in graduate school, actually, Francis Ford Coppola's team called me and asked me if I wanted to design a truly blindfolded wine experience. And Francis Ford Coppola, the filmmaker, you know, when he calls you and asks you to do something, you say, oh yeah, absolutely. And then you hang up and realize, what did I just agree to? So I ended up developing uh, for Francis Ford Coppola while in graduate school, by the way, a truly blindfolded wine experience where we temporarily remove eyesight from people who use their eyesight for 85 to 90% of the information they take in from their surroundings as that, that lens to take that information in, we, uh, we pulled that all together. And, uh, you know, people come, came through the program and just were inspired because they, we, we don't use the blindfold to show people what it's like to be me. I can't show anyone what it's like to be me in an hour, yeah. but we take away that eyesight and we allow people to not be distracted by eyesight for a little while. Well, you know, when you think about it, eyesight is actually can actually be extremely distracting as a sense. Absolutely. So Absolutely. when we temporarily remove it, people can really sink into understanding the conversation that we're having, and they can taste things they maybe never tasted before in wine, and it just becomes kind of a magical experience. Um, it's funny because I do these um, inspirational audios for people, and I say to people. Try to eat a meal without talking to anybody. Sit mm -hmm. by yourself. Don't have any other distraction other than eat the food and see how it tastes. Because I don't think we yeah. even comprehend what things taste like. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. And that's that's what I try to do in, in everything that I that I do is let's let's not be distracted and let's just experience the conversation, the words that are being said around us, as well as then what the seat beneath us feels like. What does the air smell like that surrounds us? And finally, how does how does this wine or whatever we're drinking or eating taste? Right. I mean, people must have been blown away, right, with that experience. People enjoy it a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and we still do them. You know, we started in wine, but that's definitely not the only uh, way that we use the the blindfolded experience. You know, we've we've done these with all sorts of foods and beverages. I've even used blindfolded, you know, temporary blindfolding to teach empathy to high school students, you know, where they're asked to do fairly high stakes activities where one partner in a, in a pair blindfolds themselves and the other um, basically assists them in what they're doing, which I think is, is really powerful. Absolutely. And so you've done that. And then additionally, let's talk about what you've got going right now. You've got a company going. Oh, I'm so excited. I, I've, uh, uh, just recently started a, a brand of uh, gourmet seasonings called Hobie's Essentials. And basically this brand started, we have two products. One is a rosemary salt 
and one is a just an amazing all-purpose seasoning for um, grilling meats and vegetables, but also in soups and stews and on avocado toast and in stir fry and gosh, wherever else you want to use it called happy paprika. Our tagline is elevating happiness. Cause I really think that we can use, we can create flavors that, that really just, you know, in food, delicious food that bring people together and really elevate and, and uplift that, that happiness. Um, Can you, um, increase the volume of flavor because we're distracted with our eyes or do you do it based on what tastes good to you? I've done it based on my, my sensory knowledge of, of flavors that really work well together. And I have enhanced, you know, th these are pretty uh, bold flavor, not bold, but, but, you know, complex flavors and they, they stop you and they make you think about, wow, what am I tasting here? Wow. That's what I love about it. That is just so cool. Thank you. Yeah, we're having fun with that. I'm also constantly a creative person. I, I use sensory literacy to, to solve problems and, and basically consult on design of, of products, but also foods and beverages as they're, as they're being put together. I'm, I'm often brought in to help develop products or tweak products to make them even better than they, than they once were. Is that from a flavor point of view or, or in what capacity? Flavor and also tactile. You know, I, 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 most of my work, I'd say about 85% of my work is in flavor and, and aromatics, but then 15% is in, is in tactile and sound. So I helped a large tech company choose which glass they would use on their next iteration of smartphone and trackpad based on texture. They wanted to talk about te glass texture, but didn't quite know where to begin. Oh my God, that is the coolest thing. Isn't that ever. crazy? <laughs> and under all this, under the auspices of all this, I, I, I just think creativity is really important and uh, basically brought together a team of, of creatives and, uh, and marketing folks uh, to, to run SensePoint, which is a creative and marketing studio. Wow. wow. And that company co-founded in, in 2017. So it's just a lot of fun, you know? And, and all this is possible. You know, sometimes people ask me, how do you do all this? And I, I don't know. I, sometimes I feel like I'm not doing very well at doing all of it. You know, the bottom line is that we're going to have our ups and our downs and we're going to have our, our challenges and our excitement as we, as we build careers and build opportunities. But, you know, the bottom line, if you want to get anything done, is just stick with it and have a positive, open mindset. You need to believe in yourself before you can do anything. You're singing to the choir, my friend. Absolutely. Mindset, I think, is almost 90% of life, right? It's everything. Yeah, it's, it is. It's the difference it? between it's the difference between success and failure, and it's the difference between happiness and deep, deep sadness. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. I love that. So uh, if you had some advice for viewers that they might not be thinking about, what would you say? Oh man, I would just say open your mind to what it is that you love. And don't do anything else. Just do what makes you happy and find a career in that field. And then you will be successful. If you try to do something, I've learned this and I've learned this the hard way, folks. If you try to do something that isn't truly authentically you, and I, I don't love the word authentic, so I'm sorry that I used it there, but I think it has good context here. If you're not authentic to yourself and what did it do what, what it is that you love doing, um, you're not going to be successful. Don't try true. to, don't try to be someone else. Just be yourself and be your best self you can possibly be. It's funny because absolutely. When we tell people, you know what, show yourself in an interview. Don't be afraid to be however you are. Don't try to mold yourself to what you think they want. You've got to be authentic. Like you just said, and absolutely. Yeah, you can no. make you make a good career coach too, my friend. Oh, thank you. You're you're kind to say that. The other thing, the other piece of advice that I'd give any anyone listening is um, is don't compare yourself to other people. You are yourself, and that's all. If you try to try to think of yourself as anyone other than yourself, it's going to be hard to hard to thrive. Really. Absolutely. You and that's just true with you. even your even anything you try to create. Don't look at what's out there. Just go forward with what you've got going, right? Absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. Because you didn't get discouraged by the paprika market today. Right? <laughs> no, you just have to have to get out there and put your stamp on it and see where it all goes. 
Oh my goodness. Well, that is so cool. Well, is there any other little nuggets you want to share before we say goodbye? Just be abundant thinkers in everything and every place you go and everything you do. Open your mind to the possibilities. You know, I have a phrase that I'm tag, uh, trademarking right now, which is it's not what it looks like. And what do I mean by that? Don't judge people by what they look like. Talk to them, get to know them. You know, if you've been in a, in a bus station, you might look at someone and say, oh, I don't want to talk to that person. I, oh, I, I can't talk to them. When they might be the person that you need to talk to and you need to know right then. So don't hesitate and be afraid to get to know unique and interesting new people. Boy, that's killer. Oh my goodness. Get out there and, and be yourself and be abundant. The more relationships you forge away with, the better. And I also want to let your, your viewers know, Nana, that anyone can get a hold of me at hobie.com. That's H O B Y.com. Uh, reach out to me. Don't be strangers. I'm always here to talk. Oh, that's amazing. That is so cool. Thank you so much for that. And um, you, you, you've got the hobie.com and then you've got a web uh, Facebook page, right? I do. I, yep. And all the socials, I'm at uh, Hobie Wedler. So Instagram.com slash Hobie Wedler, TikTok slash Hobie Wedler, LinkedIn, all of them. So reach yeah. out to me. You're doing TikToks? I'm on TikTok. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna to have to check that out. <laughs> check it out. Yeah, we're we're doing a lot of our uh, a lot of our videos about our products there, and I I do some videos from time to time where I just talk to people about life and and what life you know what what makes me sort of tick in life and and being you know really embodying what the importance is of embodying a diverse mindset you know all that stuff. So we have fun. Well, I hope we can do another interview, Hobie, because I would no, love I would love it a different path entirely because my goodness you're a wealth of information oh well i'm excited to chat with you thank you well i'm going to sign off here but don't go away i'll be right back thank you thank you so thank you everybody for joining us today and uh be positive folks yes positive and to your success because i live to here i got the job <laughs> exactly yes more power to you absolutely